Doctrine Matters. And we'll discuss why as we continue our journey through the scriptures on Untwisting the Gospel. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to join you and to study the Word of God. The Word of God teaches us who God is. It teaches us what He requires of us. And most importantly, it teaches us what He has already done by His grace through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, what He has done for us. There are many people who say that doctrine doesn't matter. All we need is love. Well, that may sound good, but in reality, how can you love someone you don't know? Without doctrine, we do not learn about God. How we learn about God is through the doctrines of the church, and they are very important. This is why we have so many crazy ideas about who God is, because everyone says, well, I believe God is this, and I believe God is that. What we believe about God or what how we make God out to be for ourselves doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what God says about himself through the inspired word of God written down by those he chose to write down his word. So over the next few weeks, Lord willing, we're going to go through the book of Jude. And Jude is a wonderful book. It's a short um, epistle, but we're going to take some time to go through it. Why? For this reason. One, so we can learn how to study the scriptures, how to bring out of the scriptures what's in it, not put into the scriptures what we wanted to say. And that's what happens so many times today. People will read a scripture or patches of scripture and they put into it what they wanted to say. That doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what it says and what it meant when it was written. So I hope you enjoy this journey with me as we go through the book of Jude. And so let's begin. Jude chapter one. Well, there's only one chapter in Jude. Jude one, verse one. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, 
beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. That is, there's so much information there. I could really speak on that for the next six weeks, but I won't do that. First of all, we see that Jude identifies himself as Jude. He's the writer of this book. And then he, he describes himself in two very important ways. First, he says, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And secondly, and brother of James. James is his brother who wrote the book of James. It's amazing that both of these men considered themselves bond servants. Let's look at it. In James chapter 1, verse 1, James says, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Jews said, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, this is very important. Why? James and Jude were Jesus's half brothers. That's right. James and Jude were the half brothers of Jesus. They had the same mother, Mary, but praise God, they had different fathers. Our Savior was not born of through the natural process of man. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, right now, I want to address something that's very important. This is why we call this program Untwisting the Gospel, because the gospel has been twisted, and especially by the Catholic Church that says that Mary remained a perpetual virgin, that she never had a relationship with Joseph, her husband. And so this is a part of the, the uh, effort to make Mary more important than she really was in the process. Mary carried Jesus Christ in the flesh. Mary carried her. She, she carried him. She was blessed among women. God favored her. But Mary in no way plays a part in our salvation. The Catholic Church teaches that you need to pray to Mary in order to get to Jesus Christ. This is not true. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us. Jesus said that when you pray, pray in my name and the Father will hear us. We don't have to go through anyone. We don't have to go through a priest. We don't have to go through Mary to get to, to Jesus Christ because Jesus himself opened the way to God. He rent the veil when he died. The veil was rent. And now we have total access to God the Father and we can enter boldly into the presence of God. So you say, Dana, how do you know that Jesus had these half brothers? Well, the scripture tells us. But first, what I'd like to do is to look at the relationship between Mary and Joseph, her husband, so we can understand what the God, what the word of God has to say about it. Let's go to Matthew chapter one, verse 24. And it says, and Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, verse 25, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Joseph did not have marital relations with his wife, Mary, until she gave birth to a son. Well, the Catholic Church teaches, well, that doesn't mean that after Jesus was born, that she was intimate with Joseph. But this is not true. This is part how the this is how the gospel gets so twisted out of tradition. Tradition does not matter. All that matters is the word of God. So let's see what the word of God has to say. We're going to go to Matthew 13, verse 54. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Jesus went back to his hometown and he was ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son, meaning Joseph's son? Is not his mother called Mary? You see the connection there? There's Joseph, there's Mary. And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Now, Judas is the Hebrew pronunciation of Jude. And Jude is the Greek pronunciation of his name. So here we see in verse 
55 that Jesus that Joseph is, that Jesus is Joseph's son and he's the Mary is his mother. Now we have to really understand this. There was scandal around the birth of Jesus. There were those who would always throw back into Jesus' face that they knew who their father was. Matter of fact, when Jesus said, I'm of my father, they would say, well, we know who our father is. So Jesus was, his whole life was faced with this seemingly, this scandal. But Jesus knew who he was. He came to reveal our heavenly father. So again, his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, verse 56, and his sisters, they said. Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? They were stunned. She said, that's just Jesus. That's Jesus who supposedly is Joseph's son and marries his mother. And we know his people. Who, who is he? Who, have you ever, <laughs> have you ever come to your, going to your back home? Say, for instance, you learn new information from the scriptures and you are just so excited to share it. And you share that you share what you've learned from the scripture and the people start, they'll look at you like, well, who do you think you are? And they think, well, I remember you, you're, you're nobody. How can you try to tell me about God when I know so much? This is what Jesus faced. It is so encouraging to know that Jesus faced everything that we face. Therefore, he understands what we face. And so we don't have a high priest who is not aware of all that we face. Praise God that he can meet our need because he faced it himself as our brother, Jesus, our brother, kind and good, who is also in the flesh. But he is totally, totally God and totally man. So let's continue. In Matthew 13 Verse 57, it says, and they took offense at him. They were offended. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. <laughs> they were offended by him. Understand, Jesus grew up in this household where his family was offended by him. And thankfully, the scripture gives us in detail one of the instances where you could see how offended his brothers were with him. John chapter seven, verse two. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near. Therefore, his brothers said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. Now, at first glance, it would seem as if they wanted Jesus to go. They believed in what he was doing. And they said, you know, you need to go over here because the people over here or the people in Judea, they need to see what you're doing because what you're doing is such important work. Well, that was not their motivation. Let's look at it in verse four, John seven, for no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, they were questioning Jesus's motive. They were saying, you're a show off. All you are is a show off. You do these things because you want to be known. But Jesus always said, I do these things to make my father known. They were transferring their way of thinking onto Jesus Christ. There are those who would do the same thing with us today. We may have pure motives, but people who are of a carnal mind cannot understand their pure motives. So don't be discouraged when you're wanting to share something or you're wanting to do something and they question your motive. The carnal mind cannot understand spiritual things, nor can they understand spiritual motivation. We are motivated to glorify God. The world is motivated to glorify themselves. So when we do things, they may think that we're trying to glorify ourselves. This brings us to what Jesus said. He said, let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. That does not mean that everyone will give glory to God because of your good works. We see this here. We see it in the passage that his brothers did not glorify the father 
because of Jesus's good works. What they did, they mocked Jesus. Jesus brought glory to the Father by continually continuing to do the good work because his father is worthy of obedience. He was showing that the father is worth being mocked. The father, obedience to the father is worth it. And God is glorified in that way. When we don't stop obeying God just because of persecution, God is glorified because we're making this statement. Our God is able to deliver us. But if he should not, we're still not going to bow. Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. That's what John 7 verse 5 says. For not even his brothers were believing in him. James and Jude who called themselves bond servants of Jesus Christ. What is a bond servant? A slave. They became slaves to Jesus Christ, just as we are, or all the redeemed are, slaves to righteousness, no longer slaves to sin, but because the Son has set us free, we are free indeed. Free indeed from what? We're free from the wrath of God the Father. We are free from a slavery to sin. We no longer desire to sin. Even though from time to time we do sin, we no longer desire to sin. And so James and Jude called themselves bond servants. But they did not believe. This is good news. Why? Because it shows the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. It shows the grace of God. We should not be surprised that Jesus was despised by his brothers because there were examples in the Old Testament of people who pointed to Christ or who were a type of Christ who were rejected by their own family, by their siblings. Let's go to Genesis 37, verse 4. But when his brothers, meaning Joseph, saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. In other words, they gave Joseph a hard time, just as Jesus' brothers did. There's another example of someone who pointed to Christ who had a hard time with his family. Let's go to 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. He despised him, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? <laughs> He was belittling David. Wasn't Jesus belittled not only by his brothers, but by the scribes and the Pharisees? Didn't they try to belittle him all the time? Wasn't Joseph belittled by his brothers sold into slavery? Back to 1 Samuel 17, 28. And Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart. For you have come down in order to see the battle. In other words, you're talking big, but you're not going to do anything. You can't do anything. I know the insolence and the wickedness of your heart, Eliab said to David. That's the same attitude that Jesus' brothers had towards him. But thank God that by the grace of God, not only did David's brothers come to believe in him, not only did Joseph's brothers come to believe in him, they believed in him. Why? They submitted to his rule. And because they of their submission, they were saved. God saved not only uh, Joseph, he's not only Egypt, but his brothers were saved. His family was saved. That was all in the plan of God. And you and I, we were just as David's brothers were, we, we did not believe in Christ. We did not believe in the one who was assigned to save us. 
But praise God, by his grace, we too now can say we are bond servants, that we are slaves to Jesus Christ. Now, a bond servant in particular is one who is called to preach the gospel. We are not all called to preach, but we are all called to a holy life. And we are called to be prepared to give an answer for our faith. So when did James and Jude come to faith in Jesus Christ? Well, they came to faith after the resurrection of Jesus. We find this in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. That's in the upper room, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They came to faith after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed because of the resurrection. We are saved because we believe in the death the burial and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the same thing happened to James and to Jude. Now, let's go back to Jude chapter one and see what else we can glean from that. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Because of the grace of God, you are a child of God. Well, what does that mean? It means that you are the called. You're the called out one. Called to what? You're called to a holy life. And you are beloved. You are loved by God. And because you are loved by God, you are being kept for Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that God the Father set aside, sanctified before the foundation of the world, a group of people that he would give to his son as a bride. And so he's saying here, you, you've been called out. You've been called because you were loved by God. Not only were you loved by God past tense, you are loved by God now. And because you are loved by God, you're being kept for Jesus Christ. So when he comes again, you will rule with him because he was raised from the dead you and I will be raised from the dead because he is in us and we belong to him. We will rule and reign with him. Isn't that good news? Why? Because we are the called, we are the beloved, and we are kept by God for Jesus Christ. This is why I say all the time, once God saves you, you are forever saved. Did you hear what I said? I didn't say once saved, always saved, because a lot of people think they're saved and they are not. I said that once God saves you, you are forever saved. We have been saved by the grace of God. We belong to him because he called us out. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. What is grace? He did it by grace. When we were yet in our sins, he called us and he seated us with him in heavenly places. We were raised with Christ to sonship with him. Oh, so when someone tells you, you can lose your salvation, take them to this text. I don't say that so we can have pride. No. I say it because it is the most humbling truth that we are saved by the grace of God. We are loved by God and he will keep us to the very end. Romans 8 says, and we know that God, who? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Well, who loves God? Those who have been called by him. Again, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, according to God's purpose, you were called and he called you because he loved you and because he loved you, he called you. I, t I tell you that, that, that right there, if that doesn't give you hope, there's something wrong. 
The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. The good news is not that God gives you the opportunity to be saved. The good news is that he has saved you. I know I'm a broken record, but this is the good news. Don't you need some good news today? People, the world is going crazy. They are acting out. But I tell you now, those in the world act out, but those who are in Christ cry out. They cry out, Abba, Father. They cry out, Lord, we are trusting in you. We have put our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ. And he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it. Romans 8, 29 says, for those whom he foreknew. Now, that does not mean he looked down the corridors of time and saw who would believe and chose them. No, because God is not subject to anyone's decision. We are subject to God's decision. So for those whom he foreknew, many he loved of his own free will before the foundation of the world. We are saved because of God's, God's will, not because of ours. God frees us our will. We are saved because of our freed will. God first frees our will from sin, from our own desire. People say, well, God won't go against your will. Yes, he will. The only way you're saved, you were saved because he went against your will. Well, how did he do it? He says it in the new covenant. I will give you a new heart and a new mind and a new spirit, and I will cause you to keep my commandments. That's going against your will, but praise God. God's will is perfect. Going back to verse 29 in Romans 8, for those whom he foreknew loved of his own free will before the foundation of the world, as described in Ephesians 1, 4, he predestined or predetermined to become, to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn or preeminent one among many brethren. Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. He is the first to be raised from the dead. And we are joined with him through faith. Continuing in, in Romans 8, 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. God calls all those he predetermined, predetermined to call before the foundation of the world. And those whom he called, he also justified. That means they were declared forever righteous as we should be before God and those whom he justified he also glorified meaning eternally removed from the internal and external presence of sin so what am I getting at here James excuse me Jude says he addresses his letter to those who are called loved and kept by God you are kept by God, by the will of God. You've been called by God because of the will of God. And because of the will of God, you are now in right relationship with him. Oh, can't you praise him today? If you ask someone, why are you saved? And they say, well, I did this, or I did that. They have no understanding of the gospel. The gospel does not begin with us. It begins with God. God, who is rich in mercy, took pity upon me. And by his grace, by his will alone, he gave me a new heart, gave us a new mind. And because of what he did, we now belong to him. Did we have to believe? Yes, but God gave us everything we need, everything necessary to believe. That's why all praise and glory belongs to God and God alone. Verse 31 of Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us or who can be against us? No one is against us if God is for us. Why? God has sealed us. He has sealed us in Christ. And wherever Christ is, that's where we are. Wherever Christ will be eternally, that's where we will be eternally. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says this. This is such a beautiful passage of scripture. And doctrine, what I'm talking about is doctrine here. You see how important it is? Verse 11 
also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be the to the praise of his glory paul is saying here that they were predestined those who first believed the early christians were predestined according to the purposes of god who works all things after the counsel of his will he doesn't confer with anyone after the counsel of his will for what end that we who were the first to hope in christ would be to the praise of his glory well, you might say, well, that only applied to them. No, it doesn't. Verse 13, in him, meaning in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit. Faith comes by hearing hearing by the message about Christ or the word of God. We were saved when we heard. Well, why could we hear? Why do, is it that one person hears and another doesn't? It is God, it is the grace of God who opens up our ears, who opens up our understanding. It is God and God alone. Again, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, this is very important. Not only did God predetermine whom he would call, he predetermined how he would call them. This is why we preach. This is why we evangelize. God gives us the privilege of partaking in the divine nature. He says, I'm going to call this person. And how does he call them? Through others who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why you don't need a rodeo. That's why you don't need a gun show. That's why you don't need to have all this lights and all this rock concerts and all this foolishness in church. Just preach the gospel and those whom God has called, they will come. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Others I have who are not of this fold and they must hear too and they will come. No if, ands, or buts, just preach the gospel. Having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. We were sealed in Christ. So what does that mean? Verse 14, who is given as a pledge, or the King James Version says, which is the earnest of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now, what is a pledge? Well, what is an earnest? When you're going to buy a home or, or you put down earnest money, what does that mean? It means that here is money to prove that I intend on redeeming this property. I'm going to purchase it. And if I don't, I lose the money. Well, let me tell you some good news here. God has put a down payment on you. He is giving you the Holy Spirit as earnest money, that proving that he intends to come back. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. And he gave you the Holy Spirit as earnest, as a down payment, looking forward to the redemption of our bodies. What does that mean? That he, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. The corruptible shall be changed into incorruptible. We will be given eter eternal bodies. The same body that Jesus had, we will have. No more sickness, no more death, no more sorrow, no more separation. 
We will be with God eternally, never to face sin again, never to fear again. Oh, happy day when Jesus comes to take us home, when he redeems us. You have been called, you are loved, and you are being kept by God. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not. The Bible says that you are called. Why? Because God loves you, and he loved you, and he will continue to love you, and you are being kept until the day of redemption. For what purpose? So you can say, look at what I did know. So that you can declare the glory of him who is glorious. The one who saved you by his grace. Who sent his son to die in your stead. The one who sent his son to face humiliation from his family. From his own people. Even now from the world. But that's all right. Because he came humbly the first time. But he's coming back as the Lion of Judah and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we will be with him forever. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you that we belong to you by your power, by your will, and your will alone. We give you the glory, Lord. I pray, Lord, today that if there's someone who is not in the family of God who has heard this message, Lord, that they are hearing the beauty and the joy that comes from knowing you. Holy Spirit, work on their heart. Call them. Lord, I make this call now to those who do not know you, that they will hear your voice. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will work even now, that those who belong to you will come to you. We all were lost sheep, and we thank you for saving us. Save them also. And may we ever remember that we have been called because we're loved and that we are loved and we are being kept by you. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs> I pray that this message has encouraged you today. I invite you to share this with someone else. Send it. Send it out. Let this good news go forward. And as it is our custom, let's repeat together. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And the church said, Amen.